Hello, this is Peter Carter. I'm making a climate emergency video. It's actually the second video on the issue of is global warming accelerating? I had planned to make this in March, but time ran away with me. But that's a good thing because uh, there's some beneficial news that's just come out very, very recently. And that is confirmation that as James Hansen has been saying, and as James Hansen and colleagues explained in their November 2023 Global Warming in the Pipeline paper that global warming was accelerating or imminently at the very least was going to be accelerating. So on the 4th of April published in Carbon Brief, Zeke Hausfather, a climate change expert, reviewed and plotted a graph of global warming that you see here running from 1970 up to 2023, the big 23 global warming record. And he plotted the trends, and very clearly uh, there's acceleration here because from 2009, there's a pretty substantial increase in the rate of warming. Also on the 4th of April, I was pleased to find on the Real Climate site that's a site where there's very interesting discussions amongst the leading climate experts, that Gavin Smith, the NASA GIS director, had confirmed that the James Hansen paper, Global Warming in the Pipeline, is on track on saying that global warming is at least imminently accelerating. So what he did was this nice combination of modeling the latest climate models, the NASA GISS, a surface temperature increase from 1980, and then put in the Hansen et al. Global Warming Pipeline paper for their predictions of where we're going to go with global temperature, and compared that with the linear trend from 1980. There's a pretty major increase in the rate of warming. Okay, so after all this time, the debate has been settled. This is shown by the Zeke Hausfather in Carbon Brief and also by Gavin Smith's uh, projection. And what I've done here is I've overlain Gavin Smith's projections onto the Hansen paper. And what shows very clearly in both of these is that global warming is definitely accelerating. And it started back in about 2010. I'm slipping this uh, NASA GIS time series. I've only just come across it. And it is the best. It is the most compelling global warming acceleration data presentation. Uh, you, it is the monthly temperature increase. It shows up both the long-term acceleration of temperature increase and the short-term. This is uh, February 2024, and the temperature increase is 1.73 degrees C. Global warming has been accelerating for quite some time, so the question, of course, is what happens now? Does it continue to accelerate? What are the implications? What does it mean for our future? This is what this video is all about. I'm going to show drivers of warming. This record is from the Bank of Canada running from 1850, and it shows the relationship between world GDP and global CO2 emissions. As you can see, they're practically in lockstep, and uh, particularly with the COVID dip in GDP and emissions, you can see they're completely matched. So passing now to a section on atmospheric greenhouse gas concentrations, that's what causes the global warming. This source is the State of the Climate 2022 from the Australia Bureau of Meteorology. They do a State of the Climate every two years. So here are the three main greenhouse gases, their concentrations up to 2022. Carbon dioxide is here, methane and nitrous oxide. By 2022, carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere had increased 50% above its pre-industrial level. Methane had increased a staggering 164% above pre-industrial, way above a increase of more than two and a half times. And nitrous oxide has increased 24%. The text from the State of the Climate is that all three major greenhouse gases are increasing at an accelerating pace 
since 1850 and are now rising at historically unprecedented rates. So, here we have it, all three major greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere are accelerating on the long term and on the short term. So, with atmospheric greenhouse gas concentrations so extremely high in the atmosphere, and with all three currently accelerating, global surface warming should be accelerating in response. We're now turning to a combination of atmospheric greenhouse gas concentrations, which is called atmospheric CO2 equivalent. CO2 equivalent is all of the main greenhouse gases expressed in terms of CO2. This is the Australia Bureau of Meteorology. So here's atmospheric CO2 equivalent in 2021. It was 516 parts per million. So in 2021, CO2 was 414 parts per million, but all of the greenhouse gases added up to 516 parts per million. So much, much higher than atmospheric CO2 alone. They are both increasing at an accelerating rate. That is very clear for both CO2 and CO2 equivalent. So it's the combination of the atmospheric greenhouse gases that is driving global heating. This is radiative forcing, and this is from the NOAA annual publication. This is called the power of greenhouse gases. So you'll see here radiative forcing is from the sum total of the changes in greenhouse gases, which continue to increase. So in uh, 2022, radiative forcing was 3.4 watts per square meter. And that is way above a warming, equilibrium warming of 2 degrees C. So you see that radiative heat forcing is definitely increasing at an accelerating rate here. And that applies to recent years. Most of it, of course, is from CO2. Next in contribution of heating is methane. Next is nitrous oxide. These greenhouse gases in red here, what the NOAA calls industrial gases, these are the F gases, as the IPCC calls them, and they include the most potent and long-lasting of all the greenhouse gases, and they're accelerating. And they are actually increasing the fastest of any of the greenhouse gases. This is the IPCC sixth assessment on cumulative heat energy from 1971 to 2018 showing the uh, components. And very clearly, this is increasing at an accelerating rate. This accounts for the warming of the atmospheric greenhouse gas concentrations and the cooling of the fossil fuel air pollution sulfate aerosols. This graphic is from the Washington Post, published December last year, 2023. It's entitled, The Forces Driving Global Heating and Temperature Change, which of course is what we're looking at. And this provides all the components of radiative heat forcing, running from 1900 to 2022. It's divided into two sections. The top half is heating components or contributions, and the bottom half is the cooling. This version of the radiative forcing components has converted the radiative forcing to global surface warming. And that's really handy for us. And you see here, that we're at 1.5 degrees C, which we are. So I have simplified it. Here's my simplified version with a little bit of extra information. Again, we're running from 1900 to 2022. The uh, main component of the heating, of course, is the greenhouse gases that's the greenhouse gas atmospheric concentrations, and they're constantly increasing because the greenhouse gas emissions are being increased. This is mainly fossil fuel emissions, and that's mainly CO2, although there is also an increasing amount of methane being emitted from the natural gas industry. So next is the uh, total forcing. This is the total net heating from all sources of heating and all sources of cooling. So the zero line here separating the cooling influences and the heating influences 
and this one which uh, pretty well runs along the zero line that's the natural forcings that comprises solar forcings and volcanic cooling forcing so the dips the big dips here are from the volcanic cooling eruptions the biggest one is from the pinatobo volcano in the philippines can exert a considerable cooling but that is a short-lived cooling so bottom here we have the uh, cooling influence and that's the aerosol the aerosols are also from fossil fuel emissions and they are cooling they are the fossil fuel emissions of air pollution acid aerosols uh, you'll see generally called sulfate aerosols and they're reflective of solar energy and they're cooling they're very short-lived but of course as they're being emitted constantly that is not short-lived so looking at the uh, greenhouse gases, there's a pretty constant acceleration from 1900 up to 2022. I'll go down now to the cooling. So there's a rapid increase in the cooling from continued fossil fuel combustion. But around 2000, the rate of cooling slowed, and around 2005, it reverses. So there is less cooling to the extent that it's a net extra heat source as the aerosol emissions are actually decreased and this comes about as a result of uh, dealing with the air pollution so as the air pollution gets improved there is a less amount of cooling aerosols being emitted so finally we end up with the total forcing heat that's being added to the climate system that as you'll see with uh, some interruptions follows the greenhouse gas heating it's less than the greenhouse gas heating because it's been reduced by the cooling aerosol there is and it's very clear i'll make it a little bit more obvious with another simplification there is an acceleration and increased rate of the uh, total net heating which occurs around 2005 so this shows my final simplification here that includes just the cooling aerosols and the total net heat forcing. But what we are interested in is the changes that come about to the rate of both. So around 2000, the rate of cooling aerosols starts to slow down. Around 2005, the rate of emissions of the aerosols has slowed down so much that it's reversed, and that would result in uh, some extra heating, so-called unmasking from the aerosols. You can see here clearly now that uh, from 2005, there's an increase in the rate of net heating. At 2019, there's actually a further very recent rate of increase of uh, net heat forcing, and those two correspond to changes in the cooling aerosols. The changes that are brought about to the aerosols result from uh, control improvement of fossil fuel air pollution there are two aspects to that the first big one is the improvement of air pollution in china which actually has been going on for many many years and it's really been quite effective uh, so effective that it results in some extra heating then there's another one and that comes from the international shipping industry so the shipping industry uh, agreed to also improve its air pollution. The air pollution from the shipping industry is really vast. There's so many huge ships on the ocean all the time, and they burn the very worst of the diesel oil, which is very heavy in sulfur. In the case of the shipping industry air pollution control, uh, these also started in 2005 in a small way and they were tightened up some years later and they were fully enforced by 2020. This shows what happened with regards to China. This is from the University of Chicago and what it shows is that the global decline in air pollution in recent years is due to China. So China is the green line here and when it goes down I've emphasized it. So in 2005 there was a reduction in air pollution in China. By 2013 this went into a, a very large significant rapid reduction in air pollution therefore a reduction in sulfate aerosols and therefore a uh, additional source of heating of the climate system. So here's the second source which is the 
change in emissions from maritime shipping industry. So this is showing the declining sulfur emissions from international shipping. This is from carbon briefs. Here is the air pollution from shipping going up, 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 up from 1980. But with the start of these um, agreements, regu regulatory agreements in 2005, there was a sharp drop in sulfate pollution. By 2019, there was a very, very sharp, rapid drop. We've now got to the section of the video which leads us to Earth energy imbalance, which is the most fundamental climate change indicator. This is a statement from a 2023 expert report on heat stored in the Earth system from 1960 to 2020. And the quote here is the Earth energy imbalance is the most fundamental climate change indicator as a measure of how well the world is doing. Moreover, this indicator is highly complementary to other established ones, like the global mean surface temperature, as it represents a robust measure of the rate of climate change and its future commitment. The global surface temperature as a single metric is a poor one. It doesn't give us any indication of future commitment. On the 15th of June 2021, there was a big joint NASA NOAA press release on a study that had found Earth's energy imbalance had doubled in the past 14 years, which was a huge shock to the scientific community. This was the first time that Earth's energy imbalance had been measured directly with certainty. This was through two independent sources of measurement, first by NASA satellites and secondly by ocean heat uptake by means of Argo floats under the NOAA. This was from 2005 to 2019 and the net planetary heat uptake is shown on this vertical axis here increasing rapidly. This is Earth Energy Imbalance. This is from a important, very useful publication in 2023. It's going to be repeated on an annual basis of indicators, an update of indicators of global climate change. And from the long and very helpful report, there's the Earth heat inventory again. You've seen this in terms of radiative forcing, and this is in terms here of energy change. Almost all of it, the ocean, this is the shallow ocean, there's the deeper ocean, just a little bit uh, left in the atmosphere there, which is causing, of course, all these disastrous impacts. So the uh, text is that in our updated analysis, we find successive increases in Earth energy imbalance for each 20-year period since 1973. So that is an acceleration of Earth energy imbalance during 1973 to 1992 that almost doubled in the period 2003 to 2022. This is from Berkeley Earth. They have a very good section on Earth energy imbalance and a good illustration of it that I'll get to. So here the question of is global warming accelerating is addressed by the Earth energy imbalance. So Berkeley Earth says the first line of evidence of acceleration comes from observations of the Earth's energy imbalance. This is a direct measure of how much extra energy is being trapped in the Earth's system as a result of changes in greenhouse gases and other factors. As long as the Earth's energy imbalance is positive, we can expect the Earth to continue warming. This shows the NASA series project, which uses satellites to estimate Earth's energy imbalance. Their data suggests that the Earth's energy imbalance has more than doubled since 2000, indicating an acceleration of global warming's impact on the Earth's system. The observed changes indicated by the series program are far more rapid than typically expected by climate models. I've emphasized aspects of the Berkeley Earth image here, and I hope it makes the components of Earth energy imbalance clearer. So this here, you see the yellow, but that goes all the way down to the bottom. That's all of the absorbed solar radiation. This here of the light brown color is the outgoing radiation. 
so here's all the solar radiation in there's the outgoing radiation and that leaves this as the earth energy imbalance so an excellent summary of the scientific evidence for the acceleration of global warming and the drivers accelerating the global warming i'll refer to this paper by forster and colleagues so the first quote is on global warming over the 2013 to 22 period human induced warming has been increasing at an unprecedented rate of over 0 0.2 degrees c per decade Effective radiative forcing. Total human cause radiative forcing has increased to 2.91 watts per meter squared in 2022 compared to 2.72 watts per meter squared for 2019 in the sixth assessment. The main contributors to this increase are from increases in greenhouse gas concentrations and a reduction in the magnitude of aerosol forcing. Decadal trends in radiative forcing have increased markedly and are now over 0 0.6 watts per square meter per decade. The atmospheric greenhouse gas is increasing at an accelerating rate and the cooling air pollution aerosols decreasing. And so adding more heat, so-called unmasking aerosol cooling heat. This is my wrap-up image where I've tried to put it all together. So I found this nice uh, illustration. I really like it because uh, it illustrates that as these drivers increase, then global warming increases. And that at present, there's a massive amount of heat in the climate system. Absolutely massive. And uh, you can see that the plots I put on the one graph, you'll see that all of these plots, all of these time series, which are global climate change indicators, from which I've selected the global warming climate change drivers. And these are time series running from 1850 up to 2023. Most of them, of course, run to 2022. For th three of them, I put uh, vertical scales of their change. This one here is atmospheric CO2 equivalent, all the greenhouse gases, which is on this time series. I've got radiative forcing, radiative heat forcing there. And for radiative heat forcing, this line here would be zero. The numbers for radiative forcing in watts per square meter are one and two and three. Back here at pre-industrial, radiative forcing is zero. The other emissions that affect radiative forcing and global warming, that's the aerosols, fossil fuel air pollution aerosols. If aerosols go up, radiative forcing and warming goes down. If aerosols go down, then there's an increase on forcing and global warming. So the good thing about doing it like this is that, number one, you can see that they all track together. And the other thing is you can see they're all accelerating right from 1875. They increase at an increasing rate. I'll start from the top here with global warming. That's from pre-industrial and that is record high. It's accelerating all the way with a recent increase in acceleration. So below here, there are the drivers. Radiative forcing here, which reaches about three watts per square meter to stabilize the global temperature and climate. Radiative forcing has to be a lot lower. So global warming will continue to accelerate so long as radiative forcing increases and certainly all the time it's increasing at an accelerating rate, which it is. So next down the list is atmospheric CO2 equivalent, all the greenhouse gases. That's the primary cause of the increase in radiative forcing. And here you get them numbered here. Below that, of course, is greenhouse gas emissions. That's expressed in CO2 equivalent for all of the greenhouse gases. Emissions of the long-lived atmospheric greenhouse gases have to decline to near zero to stabilize temperature and climate. And that applies to the net zero mitigation target. So last is the primary driver, which is the world economy. The world economy that externalizes environmental damages and costs 
So they're all record high and they're all increasing. I've listed them here with the latest result and uh, I provided the access for you to follow them. So in conclusion, I hope you can find this useful, helpful. Thank you for listening watching. Here ends the video on global warming acceleration.